I'm Gavin Cleesby, the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm happy to welcome you uh, to our program today. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to offer a special welcome to anyone who may be joining us for the first time. If you're not familiar with Mass Historical Society, uh, we are the first historical society in America, founded in 1791. For the past 230 years, we have been a resource for the public. Today, we maintain a research library, have galleries open to the public, and host a wide variety of programs for both academic and public audiences. That is just a sample of the wide variety of programs we host. We're only able to produce these programs because of the support of our members. Uh, we hope that you'll return for future events, and we hope you'll support our work with becoming a member or making a donation. This evening, we are joined by Michael Meyer, uh, who may win the award for joining us from uh, farther away than any of our other speakers. Uh, he certainly has not been enjoying the warm weather in Boston today, as he's uh, currently in Taipei, Taiwan, um, and he is joining us from 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Um, he is the author of the acclaimed nonfiction books, The Last Days of Old Beijing, Life in the Vanishing Backstreets of a City Transformed, and In Manchuria, a village called Wasteland and the Transformation of Rural China. Uh, he first arrived in China in 1995, and for over a decade contributed there for the New York Times, uh, the Financial Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, Slate, Smithsonian, This American Life, and many other media outlets. He is a Fulbright Scholar and a recipient of the Whitting Writers Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and two Lowell Thomas Awards for travel writing. Um, he also uh, won 2017 National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar Fellowship. Uh, when not in Taiwan, uh, he is a professor of English at the University of Pittsburgh, where he teaches nonfiction writing. Tonight, he'll be speaking with us about his new book, Benjamin Franklin's Last Bet, The Favorite Founder's Device of Death, Enduring the Afterlife, and Blueprint for American Prosperity. Uh, this book explores Franklin's gift of 2,000 pounds to Boston and Philadelphia to be lent out to tradesmen uh, over the next two centuries to jumpstart their careers. Each loan would be repaid with interest over 10 years. If all went according to Franklin's uh, inventive scheme, the accrued final payout in 1991 would be a windfall. Of course, things rarely go according to plan. Uh, Professor Meyer will uh, let us know what happened with these grand plans. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Michael Meyer. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Gavin, for that great introduction. Um, now, I am on a shared screen. I know when I move my hands, it looks like bats are attacking me sometimes. So I'll try to keep my, my hands down here. Um, OK, so I want to point out as we begin, um, really great book design, right? You're not supposed to judge a book by its cover. But the designers at the publishers did a very good job of setting the tone for what's inside this book when you open the covers. And you see these three black bands across Franklin's face. This is a very well-known portrait of Benjamin Franklin painted in his 70s when he was in Paris. Um, as you know, it's on the $100 bill. And by putting the bars over his face like this, it really, to me, brings out those basset hound eyes and a sort of sadness and weariness about him, which is so different than I think what I thought I knew about Franklin as this energetic inventor and statesman and just, you know, man of all seasons sort of thing. But you know, it turns out, as I'm going to talk about in a moment here, that Franklin at the end of his life was not, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say he was unsatisfied, but things weren't going as well for him personally, politically, and financially as perhaps um, they had earlier in his life. And these three black bands also represent, the book is divided into three acts. The first act is his death, the circumstances that are around him as he's expiring. The second act is the first hundred years of his afterlife, where he has this loan scheme I'll talk about to Boston and Philadelphia tradespeople. And then the third act is the next hundred years, all the way up to 1991 and beyond, as I think quite remarkably, people in Boston and Philadelphia did step forward and keep his loan scheme alive. And in fact, you can still use Benjamin Franklin's money today, both in Boston and Philadelphia. And I'll end on that note with some images. These black bands also represent badges of mourning. These were the black arm bands that US officials and US people, Americans would wear um, to show their respect for the deceased. And much to my shock, when Benjamin Franklin died, he received no state funeral 
The first state funeral was not held until 1799, nine years later for George Washington's death. When Franklin died, in fact, George Washington refused to wear a badge of mourning for Franklin. He said he did not die in office. He did not die on the battlefield. If we begin this precedent, where will it end? This greatly incensed people such as Thomas Jefferson, his Secretary of State, and James Madison in the House of Representatives. The congressman agreed to wear badges of mourning. Uh, the Senate, presided over by Vice President John Adams, refused to wear badges of mourning. And so again, to my great shock, the country that mourned Franklin the most in the immediate months after his passing was not his own. It was France, where in the book I talk about, there was you know this riot of three days of very intense encomiums and funerals and public eulogies for Franklin. Franklin's own funeral, his official funeral, in which a eulogy was delivered, um, did not take place till nearly 11 months after his death. And at that time, the man who stood to give the American eulogy for Franklin was not David Rittenhouse, his friend, the astronomer for whom the square is named in Philadelphia. It was not Thomas Jefferson, a person that Franklin admired a great deal. In fact, the honor fell to a uh, dipsomaniac Anglican uh, reverend who loathed Franklin. He was a man that one of the few people you could really count as Franklin's true enemies in life. And for all of Franklin's great inventions, this man at his eulogy mentioned only one. He said, Franklin invented the fireplace flu. Uh, it was a bit ignominious um, at his departure. Now, I want to start before, I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to this subject. And I want to lay out for you what Franklin was trying to do with his last will and testament what his heirs received because he had a very fractured family when he died. And then I'll talk about the loan scheme. But I, I wanna, I mentioned John Adams and I have to say that, you know, here at the Massachusetts Historical Society, a place where I spent countless hours rifling through boxes, following the trail of the people that um, kept tabs on Franklin's money in Boston. You know, the John Adams papers are also here. And Adams is a very interesting person. You know, um, I think he gets, I think he gets a bit of a bad rap in contemporary history because people see him as a crank and he certainly was that, but he was a very well-rounded crank and he was a very self-aware crank. Um, as lawyers often can be, I say, as married to a lawyer. Um, you know, Adams has a very famous letter he wrote that's quoted a great deal in his biographies and it was even quoted in the recent Ben Franklin uh, miniseries on PBS by Ken Burns. And it's Adams fuming in 1790 that the history of our revolution will be one continued lie from one end to the other. And he said that people are going to write that Franklin smote the ground with his lightning rod and outsprung General Washington and the entire revolution was conducted under the ages of these two men. This is what's often quoted, but that letter continues. And this is what I, what I love about Adams. There's always another human side to him. He says, if this letter should be preserved, and read a hundred years hence, the reader will say, the envy of this John Adams could not bear to think the truth. But this, my friend, to be serious, is the fate of all ages and nations. No nation can adore more than one man at a time. And much to my surprise upon his death, Benjamin Franklin was not that man. Now, how did I find this story? Um, I was one of the first Peace Corps volunteers sent to China. I went over in 1995. I did not speak any Chinese. I could not use chopsticks. Our government and its infinite wisdom put me in China. Um, and I ended up staying for over a decade. And as Gavin mentioned in his introduction, I wrote three nonfiction books about life and the sort of unobserved corners of that country. I came back to the States and I was working at the New York Public Library, actually. I was at, a, at the Coleman Center working on a book and I got an invitation for then Chinese President Hu Jintao's state visit to DC. Now, I wasn't important enough to go to the state dinner. I don't think writers ever are, but I would said I was invited to the state luncheon. And I walked in, you know, I bought my first ever suit off the clearance rack at Herald Square, I took the train down to DC, sweating, ill fitting, uncomfortable. And I stepped into these reception rooms in the State Department, and it was like a movie set. You know, it was these these honey colored herringbone wood floors and Paul Revere silver and Chippendale sofas and those big heavy curtains that are always catching fire in movies. And Colin Powell was talking to Barbara Streisand and Yo-Yo Ma was playing his cello. 
And I felt really out of place. And so I stepped out of the room really uncomfortably and, and sidled into this adjoining room. And I walked over to this desk here and I put my hand on it to try to exhale. And a voice behind me said, please don't touch that. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, is it old? And it was a Marine guard who stepped forward from the wainscoting and he said, that's the table where Benjamin Franklin signed the Treaty of Paris. And I have to say at that moment, I felt very stupid because A, I didn't know that Franklin had signed the Treaty of Paris and B, I forgot what the Treaty of Paris was. And so this Marine guard and I started chatting and he was showing me various Franklin memorabilia around these reception rooms. And he said, you know, Franklin is considered the father of the foreign service. And I said, I didn't know that. And he said, well, you know, you're carrying a little Franklin with you when you go overseas because he helped create the motto that's emblazoned on our passport, e pluribus unum. I said, I didn't know that. And he said, look at this figurine. Here we see Franklin and Louis XVI signing the Treaty of Alliance in 1778. Louis XVI is 24 years old here um, and he's in all his you know, royal regalia. Franklin is 72 years old and he's wearing his fur collared robe with his unpowdered hair down to his shoulders. And I have to say at that moment, you know, as I'm sweating through this terrible suit I was wearing so uncomfortably, I, I thought we should credit Franklin for also inventing business casual um, because, you know, when he was in Paris as, as minister for the, for the United States, he was really playing up his quote unquote, his Americanness, his casualness. And Marie Antoinette, when she finally met him at his, as a reception, she sniffed that had Franklin been born in France, he would have risen to be at most a bookseller. Um, I think Franklin knew this as well because he puts the, a, a line just like this in the first um, line of his will, which I'll get to in a second. I went back to the hotel that night and started Googling Franklin. And I thought, how do I not know anything about this guy? In my mind, he had sort of become the guy who flew the kite into lightning, uh, which turns out to be apocryphal. It was likely his son, William, who held the kite string as Franklin touched his knuckle to the key and felt that delicious vibration, that, the, that slight shock. Um, but, you know, you start pulling at the string of Franklin, and it is like a kite string pulling at your feet, because the man was large, he contained multitudes, and I don't think we need to, we could spend the next hour talking about everything he invented, it was far beyond the fireplace flu, uh, you know, bifocals, the lightning rod, the glass harmonica instrument, he coined words such as electrician and battery, he founded the first library in the colonies, the first fire department, he co-founded the first hospital and college, he designed a better catheter, a more efficient stove. He explained the Northern Lights. He mapped the Gulf Stream. And my favorite one of all, though, was something he discovered in Boston's Mill Pond as a, a young boy. You know, Franklin was, knew he wanted to ship out. Um, he thought his life in Boston was going to be, you know, one where he's departing to go overseas. But his older brother had drowned at sea. And Franklin's father forbid him to go to sea. And so Franklin said, you know, dad, I'm going to train myself to survive a shipwreck. And so in a letter to a French friend, he describes how he would strap suitcases full of books on his back and swim in Boston Harbor to strengthen his swimming muscles. But my favorite invention was swim fins that he came up with in the mill pond to increase his speed. They were wooden paddles. I was fascinated by the fact that Franklin, um, you know, could be credited and some people do credit him as the founder, the forerunner of the open source movement, because Franklin refused to take out, there were no patents at that time, but he could have taken out exclusive commercial licenses on his inventions. But he said, just as I benefit from the technology of others and the other inventions of others, I want people to benefit from mine as well. Um, and so, you know, he's the forerunner of the open source movement, but we can also credit him as a forerunner of microfinance through his last will and testament, which I'm going to talk about. Now, the other thing I didn't know about Franklin is that he was once young, you know, often again, like the image on the cover of the book that I started this talk with, he's this wizened old, you know, American Yoda who's sort of spinning out, you know, gnomic quips every now and then, many of which were taken from other sources. He's, he freely admits this at the last edition of his Poor Richard's Almanac that, you know, a lot of his bon mots, the best things he said were actually borrowed from others and improved by himself as well. But I sort of, you know, I fell into this pool of Franklin and this led me on a decade's worth of research, both at 
the Massachusetts Historical Society, at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, at our Library of Congress, at city archives, especially the Boston City Archives, which is wonderful librarians who should be paid more, um, but also to London. You know, I, I, the, the Marine was the person who reminded me, I, I don't think I ever knew this, that Franklin spent most of the last three decades of his life overseas. Um, and you can see, you can still visit his house in London. Here's the Benjamin Franklin house on Craven Street. This is between Trafalgar Square and the Thames. And you can still go in his old room where he used to take his air baths. You know, he believed that they were good for circulation. So after he would swim in the Thames, you can imagine the sewage and the things on him after that. After he would bathe, he would sit in front of these windows naked and, and cool off or dry off that way. Um, and he says it was a wonderful practice, but we don't know what his neighbors across the, the lane felt of that. I also went up to Ecton, which is the Northamptonshire village from which Franklin's father emigrated to Boston. Uh, he was a Congregationalist. He did not want to join the Anglican Church. Um, and so truly did, was a pilgrim, came over to Boston in search of religious freedom. Now, Josiah, Franklin's father, was a skilled dyer. And when he got to Boston, you know, this was a city of 10,000 people in the early 1600s, or 1700s, excuse me. Um, and people were grazing, you know, cows and pigs on the common. And he quickly realized that he was not going to make a living uh, being a, you know, fine, selling fine uh, cloth and fine dyed goods here in Boston. And so he became a candle maker instead and a soap maker. Um, and Josiah, you know, in many ways became a public utility. There are some estimates that said Josiah and his shop um, supplied up to a third of all of Boston candles at this time. Now, the reason I'm showing you this and I'm running up to this is I want to say that when I visited this grave um, in the Ecton Church in, in the, mid, uh, the mid levels here in the Midlands, excuse me, in England, I went to the grave of Franklin's uncle Thomas and his aunt Eleanor. And the reason I'm bringing this up is, um, you know, Franklin, I think a lot of the things that I learned about him came to me through his autobiography, his memoir. And he does not, the, the events of that book end in 1757. And he addresses that book. That book begins, Dear Son, comma. And so in that book, you know, he's purposely showing his son all the successes he had in his life. He doesn't want to talk about the mishaps or the errors he made. And so in that book, you get a very perfunctory, um, introduction to Deborah, his wife, who I'm going to talk about in a moment. But also one thing glaringly missing from those pages is the fact that Benjamin Franklin owned slaves. His family owned up to six, maybe seven servants, as he called them, um, starting in the 1730s, 1740s, 1750s. Franklin profited from the slave trade. He's, you know, in his Pennsylvania Gazette newspaper, he had advertisements constantly um, advertising rewards for runaway slaves, enslaved people. He also advertised slave auctions. At the same time, Franklin is often like this. You could say one thing about Franklin and say, yeah, but the, the flip side of that is Franklin also published the first abolitionist tract in the colonies uh, by uh, the leading abolitionist at the time, Benjamin Lay. Um, all apostates who keep men in bondage are, or all men who keep people in bondage are apostates. Um, Franklin did not put his name on the cover page, however, as having printed that. And so the reason I'm showing you these graves is in the memoir, Franklin talks about going to visit the graves of his ancestors, but only in a letter to Deborah, his wife, does he reveal that the stones were so covered in moss that we could not read the engravings upon them until Peter, the enslaved man who, quote, behaves very well to me, knelt and scoured them clean. And so I found this too, like there's 8,000 pieces of surviving correspondence of Benjamin Franklin. So you think like, oh, I'm gonna write about his will and his afterlife. This is why it took me a decade because I was reading through all of this material and trying to get a full picture of the man and who he was at his death. Now, the reason I bring this up is that I think Franklin is often portrayed as being a self-made man. And he was anything but. And this directly relates to his last will and testament, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, you know, he benefited from unpaid labor, obviously, through enslaved people that were working in his print shop. But he also benefited greatly from the help of his common law wife, Deborah, Deborah Reed, who became Deborah Reed Franklin. You know, Debbie, as he called her in letters, um, like I said, she often, Franklin's biographers are almost always men. And when you look back at the last hundred years, especially, you know, Franklin's life is this blockbuster production, and Debbie often has a walk-on role in the recounting of this, where she comes on, 
She sort of entraps him into domesticity. She chooses not to go with him to London. And this is often seen as, you know, a detriment. Oh, she's closed minded. She's cloistered. When in fact, I find her to be anything but these things. Um, you know, people often describe her as being plain. I find her to be quite beautiful. She's whip smart, intelligent. Um, well, you can go back and look at the ledgers from their print shop. This is at a time long before the US dollar is made official currency in 1792, obviously. Debbie is running a shop that's selling chocolate, barrels of mackerel, uh, print, paper, sales, et cetera, et cetera. And she's recording the different transactions in multiple currencies, in Mexican dollars, in South American, specie, in, in European currencies. Um, she's calculating this all on her own and she's figuring out change. She's running their vast real estate portfolio. The Franklins invested in real estate early on. Largely, this was because Debbie inherited her parents' Market Street shop that became Franklin's print shop. He really does get his start, his footing as a business person um, with her help through the property and also her as, she's more than a partner. She's a co-owner of the business. Um, and it's rather painful when you read the correspondence between Franklin and Debbie in the early goings in the 1750s and the 1760s, you know, they're quite loving to one another. Um, and Franklin even grants Debbie power of attorney. This is some 80 years before laws of coverture in Pennsylvania are repealed. A married woman at that time was no, had no better legal rights than a dependent child. Um, and I found the, the pre-printed form that gave Debbie power of attorney. The form says, I give my friend, and you would write a man's name in, and Franklin crossed out friend and wrote wife and then wrote in Deborah Franklin's name. So he trusted her completely in business. And you see this, by the way, this is an ex, a little snippet from his last will and testament, which he wrote in 1789, a year before he dies, several years after Deborah had already passed away. She had overseen construction of their Philadelphia home while he was away in London and then in Paris. They never lived in that house together, actually. Franklin comes back a widower. And as he's writing his last will and testament, you know, you think of all the things that Franklin could have asked to be remembered for, of all the things Franklin could have asked his epitaph to say. And if some of you have been to George Washington's grave at Mount Vernon or Thomas Jefferson's in Monticello, you know, these are very elaborate or sort of congratulatory tombs. Franklin instead in his last will and testament said he wanted to lie under a simple rectangular slab same dimensions as a piece of newsprint, which I love. It looks like he's sleeping under a newspaper, uh, but this is all he wanted on his epitaph. So for all of Franklin's achievements in life, he only wanted one listed on his gravestone and it was Deborah. Let's talk about what else is in the will. Uh, you can hold the will at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. Um, it's, it's now it's in a sort of, it feels like you're holding a menu at an expensive restaurant that's in a red leather sort of, um, you know, accordion style portfolio, you open it up, but it's great. I mean, you see the red wax thing clinging precariously to the parchment still, you see his signature. Um, so let's talk about this and what Franklin wanted to do. He was the oldest founder when he died by far. You know, he was the oldest person at the, the oldest delegate at the Constitutional Convention by far. He was 26 years older than George Washington. Um, and when Franklin comes back from Paris in 1785, he feels like the country he helped found is a bit unrecognizable to him. And at the Constitutional Convention, he argues quite strongly that public officials should not be paid public officials should not receive a salary. Now, why is that? He said that when he lived in England and lived in France, he found that people are willing to accept a king or a monarch as their ruler in place of a handful of aristocracy that will not act in working class and common people's best interests. And so he said, in order to ensure, we don't have a king, obviously, we don't have a monarch, but in order to ensure that a group of aristocrats don't come to rule us, we should make it in the, we should put it in the constitution that public servant, public officials cannot be paid. Places, you know, offices should not be places of profit. He said, if you don't do this, the greedy and the rich will become your rulers. His other delegates, you know, his fellow delegates sort of laughed behind their hands at this. Um, James Madison wrote that, you know, out of respect for the elder Franklin, we nodded along, but no one was going to take this proposal seriously. 
Franklin also at the time said he wanted to raise um, in the Constitution the question of slavery. He had repented for his earlier sins. Franklin is rare, I think, among old people. Maybe not. You tell me old, if anybody older is watching this. He became more progressive as he aged, and he was more willing to admit his mistakes. Um, and so he renounces slavery. He becomes appointed uh, president of the Pennsylvania uh, Society for the Abolition of Slavery. And after the Constitutional Convention ends, you know, in the Constitution itself, they kick the can down the road on the issue of slavery until 1808, until a generation had passed. Um, he, after the Constitutional Convention is over, he presents the first petition to Congress for the abolition of, calling for the abolition of slavery, which of course is roundly rejected. And many people, Northerners and Southerners alike, were furious with Franklin when he did this. He said, you were the one at the Constitutional Convention arguing for states' rights. And now the very pact that we agreed upon, you're trying to, to break it. And so when Franklin you know, is writing his will in 1788, 1789, he knows the document is going to become public. He's upset that the gentry are coming to rule the United States. He's upset that slavery has not been raised. He's upset that the college that he co-founded, the Philadelphia Academy, which is now the University of Pennsylvania, was no longer a great leveler which he had hoped it would be. He hoped he founded it so it would provide instruction in accounting, proper public speaking, uh, business training. He wanted it to help create a middle class. Instead, when he comes back to Philadelphia, he, founds, he finds that it's teaching oh boy, Latin and Greek and has really become a finishing school for the blue bloods of, the, of, the, of Pennsylvania. And so Franklin, I think, is unique, too, among people who started a university and that he left it nothing in his will. And instead, he says, you know, that money that I was going to leave my school and the money that I forsook to accept when I was governor of Pennsylvania, he served as governor, they called it president then, for three years. He said that 2,000 pounds, I want to put it to better use. And so in his last will and testament, he decides that he's going to stake the working class. And he says, I'm going to have two pots of money, one going to Philadelphia, where I made my fortune, one to Boston, where I was raised and learned my trade. And I want someone to step forward and manage this loan scheme for me, not only for the, you know, in the next decade, but for the next 100 years and the next 200 years. And when it's at the centennial mark of my death, I want Bostonians and Philadelphians to come together, take a big chunk of that money, because with compound interest, it will have accrued in value. And I want you to agree to build something that will benefit the common good. I sort of picture Franklin laughing as he writes this, because he thinks like, after the Constitutional Convention, how can anybody agree on anything? Uh, but then he goes further and he says, look, I want you to keep this money in circulation for another 100 years. And at the bicentennial of my death in 1990, it turns out to be 1991 after the scheme was started, you're gonna to come together again and we'll cash out the entire bonanza, this windfall and build something to benefit or you make it you know, put to use something for Philadelphia and Boston. I should go back a second um, before I jump to his death notice here in the Pennsylvania Gazette. This is the coda still here where my, my cursor is. He adds this two months after Washington is inaugurated, 10 months before he dies. He's emaciated, he's suffering from pleurisy, he's suffering from horrible kidney stones. I found the, the uh, physician's receipts for the drugs he was taking. You know, I think 18th century medicine was as bad as the ailments. He was taking a lot of opium, laudanum, uh, something called Daffy's Elixir, which was a brandy-based sort of sedative. Franklin's in a lot of pain and he's wasting away. He's skeletal in his bed. And he says, oh, I remember you know, that a French guy sent me this idea when I was in Paris. He sent me an essay called The, Te the Last Will and Testament of Fortunate Richard, instead of Poor Richard. Um, and in this, the guy, you know, talks about the value of compound interest. And a guy takes this money and puts it aside for 100 years. And then with that bonanza that results, um, he funds women's job training so they get equal pay. He funds a universal income for childcare so newborn kids have three years of, of help. Et cetera, et cetera. So Franklin writes to this French guy and says, hey, you know, I remembered your idea. Again, many of Franklin's best ideas are taken from other people. 
and he puts it in the codicil. And he says, look, I, I took your idea and I'm setting up these loan schemes for tradespeople in Boston and Philadelphia. And I hope it will do some good beyond, my, beyond the grave because in my mind, the best citizens are apprentices because apprentices and tradespeople see the effect of policy and taxation on everyday life. They interact with all different classes, colors, creeds, origins, et cetera. Um, and they have their ear to the ground of how policy should be conducted. So he stakes the bet and he says too in the codicil, I think that people in Boston and Philadelphia are gonna have to step forward and manage the scheme for free. And he says, if Boston doesn't accept the money, Philadelphia gets all of it. If Philadelphia doesn't accept the money, Boston gets all of it. He's already playing into the rivalry of these two cities that they had at the time. As many of you know, Boston and Philadelphia are and were then very different cities. Boston was more like a Bristol, um, a size comparison, you know, it was the, it was the city of, of religion, it was the city of academies, of higher learning, it was largely homogenous. Philadelphia was a bustling, diverse port that was the city of finance, of publishing, of trade, um, and then it became the U.S. government capital as well. Now, let's go ahead to the will and what happens to this. So this is Franklin's death notice in the Pennsylvania Gazette. Um, I like the black border that's as long and leaden as a casket, and it announces the funeral. Philadelphia at that point was 28,000 people. Um, excuse me. It was the largest city in the United States. About 20,000 estimated people came to his funeral. Uh, Boston did not have a public service, actually, but why would it? You know, news traveled slowly in those days. Um, like I said, even in New York City, uh, the federal government decided not to officially mourn Franklin. In the Boston City Archives, you can pull down the ledgers and start flipping the pages of, of the loan schemes. And this is the title page for Boston's. I love this old cursive writing and I love the crinkling pages it makes. The City Archives, if you don't know, um, are out behind a Home Depot in Roxbury. Um, and it was sort of fun to sit in this gorgeous, you know, it's, it's a warehouse space, uh, but I sit all by myself out there and start seeing Boston at that time come to life because the first person in Boston who received a loan um, was a bricklayer named Daniel Tuttle. And Franklin said, I don't, we can't have any defaults on these loans because I want people repaying their money at 5% interest below market rate. I want them repaying it in installments over 10 years. And I, no one can default because if, as you repay the money, it's going to help the principal grow. We can make more loans to tradespeople. And then as this money keeps going, we'll have this windfall for 100 years and 200 years hence. And so he required that two people guaranteed each loan. And often in the ledger, you see it's the people under whom the guy had apprenticed. And this was exclusively for men in the first 100 years. The scheme is expanded to women. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so you see Daniel Tuttle, the bricklayer, receives his first loan. It's probably backed by his, the people under whom he apprenticed because they're both Masons. But as you're looking in the early loans in Boston, especially, you see a lot of famous names who are stepping forward and guaranteeing these loans, including Samuel Adams, including uh, Paul Revere, who backed Thomas Ayers, his son-in-law, who was a silversmith. As you're turning the pages too, you, you see Boston sort of assemble before your eyes because the tradespeople that received the loans really could have run the entire city. It was, um, you had a house right, you had a glazier, a cabinet maker, a blacksmith, a candle maker, a saddler, a shoemaker, a jeweler, a hairdresser, a distiller, a cooper, and a baker. And finally there was a printer. Um, and it's really, I, I like to think of the people who are administering these loans, thinking like, let's give, try to give one to each trade to help them hang their shingle out and start. Um, Boston got a much faster start than Philadelphia. This is an ad in Franklin Grant's, Franklin's grandson's uh, Benny's, who took over the newspaper for him. This is an ad in his newspaper in Philadelphia, 1792, a year later, where it's still calling for people to come forward and, and apply for a Franklin loan. Uh, Boston had no shortage of applicants and, and filled its ledger rather quickly. Philadelphia was slower going. When I give this talk to Philadelphia audiences, they laugh knowingly. They said Philadelphia city government has always worked on these principles. <laughs> Things take time. Um, no one knows what the other, you know, one hand doesn't seem to know what the other hand is doing. Uh, Boston has always been managed much more efficiently uh, than, than Philadelphia. Um, 
And, you know, I want to talk briefly too, as these loan schemes are starting, you know, Franklin also, as I said, knows that his will is going to be published. And so he's settling scores. He's not only settling scores with his fellow founders about, I'm going to start this loan scheme. I'm going to do something really different than any of you are going to do in your will, I'm sure. Um, he makes sure to note that people who owe him money can have that debt forgiven only if they release the enslaved people that are under uh, their roofs. Um, but then finally, you know, he has four main heirs and he uses his bequest to each heir to settle scores as well. And I'm not going to talk a great deal about these in the book. I go into more depth with this. The first is his grandson, Temple, uh, who's seen here at the signing of the Treaty of Paris, actually. The British would not sit for the portrait. I love that fact. Um, but Temple is the son, the, the illegitimate son of Franklin's illegitimate son, William, we'll talk about in a second. And to Temple, Temple is sort of a fop and a roué um, and doesn't really make good on any of his great promise in life. And to Frank, you know, Franklin leaves him all of my papers. And he says, I want you to edit my memoir and get my papers published. And Temple botches the job. It takes him nearly two decades to get going. And it's actually John Adams who starts coming out of the wings and encouraging Temple to get to work. Franklin's other grandson, Benny, uh, who's named after Benjamin and looked a lot like Benjamin, right down to the bifocals and the high brow and the hair down to his shoulders, um, inherits Franklin's printing press. Franklin says, I should have trained my children to learn a trade. Um, so he trains Benny to be a printer. And Benny uh, becomes quite a muckraker in the 1790s in Philadelphia. And he's publishing diatribes against George Washington for owning slaves. You know, how can the apostle of liberty uh, as president of our country be rotating slaves from Virginia to Pennsylvania to the capital in Philadelphia, when at that time under law, after Pennsylvania had abolished the slave trade, any enslaved person who would be in Pennsylvania for six months would automatically be freed. And Washington made sure in letters that people, you know, his staff knew every five months and two weeks, every five months and three weeks, I want these enslaved people rotated back to Mount Vernon so they will not be freed. Benny, Franklin's grandson, gets the nickname Lightning Rod Jr. as he's attacking Washington and the Federalists, including John Adams and Hamilton. This is an editorial cartoon from that time where Benny's newspaper shows a critic attacking him, this porcupine who's um, writing these diatribes against Benny, while Lady Liberty weeps over the portrait of Franklin. I was fascinated to learn that the first American charged under the Alien and Sedition Acts was none other than Benjamin Franklin's grandson and chief heir, Benny. You can still visit the print shop here on Market Street today. Uh, Franklin's daughter, Sally, received the bulk of his estate. This is long before the laws of coverture were abolished in Pennsylvania. Franklin, in his will, pointedly notes, hey, husband of Sally, Richard Bache, everything I'm give, giving to my daughter, these specific expensive worthwhile gifts are for hers and hers alone. You cannot own them. I want her to have an independent income, independent of you. One thing Franklin gives to Sally is this portrait of Louis XVI, which is ringed in diamonds. Louis gives this to him as his parting gift as he leaves France. Because of this, we have the emoluments clause in the constitution that we're not supposed, public, uh, public officers are not supposed to be accepting expensive gifts from foreign powers. Jefferson gave, uh, gave uh, Franklin a freebie on this one, gave him a pass. So Franklin gets to keep this portrait of Louis XVI ring with diamonds, and he leaves this for his daughter, Sally. And he says, though, please don't take the diamonds and make them into jewelry. It's a wasteful habit. And I love the fact that Sally instead takes the diamonds and sells them to finance her first trip overseas. Because I've been stuck at in Philadelphia taking care of my mother, Debbie. I've been taking care of seven children. Uh, you've taken the boys in the family to Paris and London. I'm going to sell these diamonds to finance, finance my first trip overseas. And so shortly after uh, Franklin's death, you see in Benny's newspaper this advertisement that Sally puts in where she's uh, lease, uh, renting Franklin's house so she can go to London. And she stays there for two years. This is the only portrait we have of Sally. I love the lace she's wearing. Uh, she once wrote to Franklin in Paris that she wanted him to send her some lace. And he said, lace, what a waste of money. It's as if you put salt in my strawberries. If you want lace, do what I do. Just buy some material and let the moths eat it. And then you'll have your, your lace. Uh, so Sally gets the last laugh in the end here. <laughs> 
Finally, Franklin's son, William, any of you know this, I won't touch on this a great deal, but William, his, his heir apparent, the boy who held the kite when they did their kite experiment um, at probably the field where Franklin stabled William's pony, um, you know, he backed the king during the Revolutionary War. So for the Franklins, it was not just, a, it was actually a civil war. Um, and William ends up in exile in London um, and dies without further contact, you know, a, a strong relationship with his father or his son for that matter. And William is buried in the St. Pancras churchyard. And in the late 1800s, when a budding novelist named Thomas Hardy is working as an architect's assistant, he's given the task of clearing this graveyard so the new train lines can come in to what will be St. Pancras Station. So if you visit London, you can go to the Hardy Tree, it's called, because Thomas Hardy oversaw the movement of these tombstones. Um, and William Franklin, Franklin's son, his gravestone is supposedly here among these furred gravestones. Now, back to the, the loans real quickly. Um, Benny, his grandson, printed these loan documents. And each borrower, as I said, would get a 10-year um, stint in which to pay back their loan. I love flipping through these. Look at this gentleman's name, Liberty Brown. He's a silversmith. Uh, Liberty was born on the 4th of July, and he receives a loan in Philadelphia in the early 1800s. Early on, Franklin's scheme really works. People are paying back their loans, and they're also running for office. Uh, Liberty Brown rises to become president of the Philadelphia City Council, which was a very powerful body at that time. Um, in Boston, the fourth mayor of the city, Charles Wells, was a Franklin loan recipient. He's the man responsible for extending Tremont Street all the way out to Roxbury. And Wells, you know, is elected, people said at the time, because people had a decided distaste for the upper middle classes and the gentry that were running Boston. So in the early 1800s, you know, the first 20 years, these first one or two generations of people receiving Franklin's loans, things are working really well, and they're fulfilling Franklin's ideals. Um, very different cities as, as we age, though, into the 1800s. You know, Philadelphia loses its status as capital. Franklin was ahead of his time, but he was very much a man of his time. He did not foresee, uh, obviously, the War of 1812, but he also did not foresee things such as the Erie Canal being opened in the 1830s, which caused Philadelphia to lose its status as chief port. He did not foresee the financial system changing um, as it did, because the New York Stock Exchange didn't open until two years after Franklin died. He also didn't foresee defaults and financial panics and speculation. Um, so while in Philadelphia, you have people such as this gentleman, this is from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, actually. This painting is called Pat Lyon at the Forge. Pat Lyon was a successful business person in the 1820s in Philadelphia. He patented fire wagons, um, early uh, firefighting wagons. And he said, I want my portrait um, to be painted wearing my leather apron. I wanna be shown as a working class person. And Philadelphia really loved this portrait and really stuck to these ideals. So while in Boston, you have John Quincy IV becoming the mayor, you know, it's almost hereditary in Boston, the mayors are being passed down. Pat Lyon is in, in Philadelphia at a time when the mayor had, is Robert Wharton. He had apprenticed as a hatter and he had quote, a decided distaste for learning. And Philadelphia elected Wharton as mayor 16 times. Um, so Philadelphia is sticking to Franklin's ideas and saying we should be helping the working class and we should keep having these loans in circulation. Boston goes a completely different route. Boston, you know, this is John Lowell is inventing, uh, is starting his first textile mills up the Charles. Um, Franklin dies two years, three years actually, before Eli Whitney patents the cotton gin. Franklin doesn't anticipate the Industrial Revolution and the vast changes that are going to happen to the American economy and the apprenticeship system. He also doesn't see the changes that are going to happen in American finance. And so here's a statue of Nathaniel Bowditch. This is in Mount Auburn Cemetery across the Charles in Cambridge. And Bowditch at this time, you know, he has a very early beginning like Franklin. He really smacked of the sea. He was an apprentice. He was apprentice himself. He made his name through hard work overseas. He recalculated um, longitudinal tables and became, you know, wrote the new navigator that sailors still, every Navy ship still has it on board today. Um, but Bowditch revolutionizes finance. And in the 1830s, Bowditch starts what Charles Lowell's called uh, the best invention in American history. 
Uh, <laughs> it is eminently a savings bank for the wealthy. And Bowditch starts what we see now today as an investment bank. Um, and Bowditch starts, you know, managing trusts for these great Boston families. And along with Bowditch, you know, you get people such as William Minot and his sons, whose papers are held at Massachusetts Historical Society. And at a time when Philadelphia is saying, you know, we should be um, propagandizing our attachments and our connections to Franklin, and we should open up the wall of the cemetery in Philadelphia so people can come and pay their respects. In Boston, on the other hand, a lot of what's happening with Franklin's legacy is taking place behind cold, closed doors. Franklin and his will stipulated that there be annual meetings held, that uh, a board of people of Bostonians should come together um, and see how his money is being used. But in Boston, you know, Boston invents the mutual fund and Boston invents the idea of what a trustee really is. And William Minot becomes the sole manager of Boston's Franklin money. And as you go forward in the ledgers and you meet a man named Samuel McCleary, who was a cabinet keeper at the Massachusetts Historical Society, when McCleary takes over for Minot after 60 years managing Franklin's money, McCleary realizes that there had not been a meeting of the trustees for nearly 60 years, that people in Boston really deferred to William Minot and what he wanted to do with Franklin's money. And what Minot did with Franklin's money was invest it in Nathaniel Bowditch's savings bank. So Philadelphia is lending Franklin's money out successively to tradespeople, even as they're defaulting and the principal is going down. Boston, under William Minot, says, no, 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 we should be focusing on the bottom line here, on the end game. What is this money going to build after 100 years? And in the book, I follow the path of McCleary, because here he is as a young man when he takes over Franklin's money. Here he is as an older man when he's fighting to get this money lent again to Boston tradespeople. In Philadelphia at the centennial mark, um, Franklin's descendants come to the fore and they say, hey, you manage this money terribly. Look at how much money Boston has. Boston at that point after a hundred years had four times as much as Philadelphia's account. So you have Franklin's descendants in Philadelphia, including Elizabeth Dwayne Gillespie, a pioneering early feminist who says, look, if you're not gonna manage this correctly, we heirs want the money. And she, along with Agnes Irwin, who was the first Dean of uh, Radcliffe College, um, both great, great granddaughters of Franklin said, we wanna take over the money. And if you're not gonna let us take over the money, we're gonna hire an attorney, a guy named George Wharton Pepper, very important character in this book, who's going to fight hard to loosen the restrictions around Franklin's will so women can benefit from it as well. And with Elizabeth Dwayne Gillespie and Agnes Irwin and George Wharton Pepper, they succeed. Now, Boston, I'm gonna show you about five more slides here and then I'll wrap up in case we have questions. Boston realizes, okay, we have this big bonanza, the centennial mark, but if we agree to build something with it, how are we gonna fund it? Because Franklin and his will said it's a one-time gift. And when the city did agree that we should build a trade school with the money, and it took 13 years for them to come to that agreement, and it was only under Henry Pritchett, who was president of the Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, galvanized public opinion that they should build a trade school with the money in Boston. The Boston city treasurer refused to release the money. And he said, no, if you do this, you're gonna burden the taxpayer. You're gonna build a trade school, but every year they're gonna need money to keep up you know, the heating and to pay faculty. Franklin's favorite invention was the matching grant. He invented the matching grant to build the Pennsylvania hospital. A young man named Andrew Carnegie, pictured here, who had a very Franklinian rise, also a naturalized American, also an immigrant who was the son of a British subject, also someone who rose to prominence, mastering the technology of his time. Franklin had the printing press. Carnegie was a telegraph operator. That's how he rose to, to um, start creating steel factories and so forth. Um, Carnegie says, you know what? I'll match Benjamin Franklin. And Carnegie at this point, you know, his reputation had been quite sullied because of the violence around the Homestead strike at the Carnegie Steel um, plant outside of Pittsburgh. And Carnegie says, you know, 
philanthropy is a good way to redeem my name in many ways. And Franklin had warned about this. In the book, I talk about a letter where Franklin said, people use charity to try to wash their hands of their sins. Um, and Franklin believed very strongly too that philanthropy or charity as it was called in his time should not be self-aggrandizing. It should not be a self-advertisement. We could have had the Franklin Academy, the Franklin newspaper, the Franklin hospital, but Franklin took his name off of his philanthropic projects because he said, if you put your name on something, other people aren't going to want to donate to the cause. They think it's only gonna promote you. So Carnegie in the early 20th century says, I will match Franklin we will build a trade school, but I want my name on it. And there was such an outcry. I'm sure many of you recognize this building down in Berkeley Street in Tremont in, in the South End. There was such an outcry that Carnegie wanted his name put on the Franklin Trade School that was built, was named Franklin Union, that he had to rescind the, the stipulation. Charles Eliot, president of Harvard, you know, publicly chastised him. And I bring this up only because some of you may know there's been a public hearing period lately because lately the Cummings Foundation, the Family Foundation has given a $12.5 million gift to the Franklin uh, Trade School, which is now the Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology to help them build their new campus, which is gonna be in Roxbury around what's Nubian Square, formerly Dudley Square. Um, but a stipulation of this gift is that the school is now gonna have the Cummings name on it. I didn't give $12.5 million. I realize philanthropy has changed these days, uh, but I do think it's a bit ironic that the building of this school over a century ago had a quite a, an outcry about putting someone's name with Franklin. Um, this time around, there doesn't see to be much of a peep of dissent. Now, a couple more slides before I wrap up here. You know, it's funny to me in the book, I find that every generation discovers Franklin for themselves. Um, our definition of Franklin changes over time. And here's a picture of Jay Gatsby from the film adaptation of The Great Gatsby. You know, in the 1920s, as we roll into the, the, the depression, Franklin all of a sudden becomes this conservative avatar. You know, here's a person that, um, you know, is common law married to Deborah. They never had a church wedding, was not a Christian. Like a lot of enlightenment thinkers, he was a deist. He believed in a God, but not necessarily the divinity of Jesus had an illegitimate son. That illegitimate son had his own illegitimate son, that illegitimate son and another illegitimate and so forth. And all of a sudden in the twenties and thirties, he becomes this paragon of conservatism and sort of the, uh, the seedy underside to artists, especially of the American dream, right? And so Gatsby at his funeral in the book, Gatsby's father shows Nick Gatsby's schedule as a young boy, which mirrors Franklin's, you know, Gatsby rises early and just, you know, he studies electricity and makes a list of needed inventions and so forth. And so Franklin in the 20s, 30s, 40s, his reputation is quite changed. All the while, his money is still out there and still circulating. And so it took 15 years nearly, of one generation for Boston to use his first batch of money at his centennial of his death. It took Philadelphia 30 years to use the first batch of his money. And they build the Franklin Institute, which is a great science museum in Philadelphia. And there's a dedication for this massive statue. If you visit this statue today, you know the plaques around the base of it call Franklin a statesperson. Uh, they call him an inventor. They don't say anything about his philanthropy which I think is really odd, nor do they talk about his working class roots. The first line of Franklin's will is, I, Benjamin Franklin, printer. He wanted people to remember first and foremost that he was a tradesperson. In the 50s and 60s, Franklin's reputation changes again. There's a, a refugee from Nazi Berlin named Walter Lyons who come, escapes Germany, comes over to Philadelphia. Philadelphia at that point was a very progressive administration. Rachel Carson is working on Silent Spring, also a native, uh, she grew up in Pittsburgh, I should say, not native. Um, but Walter Lyons is starting the environmental movement in Pennsylvania, and he's working on clean water. And he says, you know, when I read Franklin's will, and I read Franklin's writings about um, water runoff and how cities should be built, I think we should see him foremost as a forerunner of the environmental movement. And Walter Lyon begins a rather quixotic attempt over 20 years to try to get Franklin's will's money unlocked to use for environmental purposes. Meanwhile, Boston and Philadelphia are still arguing over how to use Franklin's money. And I love this. In the end of the day, you know, Boston comes back around, they find Samuel McCleary's notes, and they say, you know, 
the idea of what an apprentice is has really changed. And in Boston, we have a lot of indebted people wearing scrubs. And maybe instead of silversmiths, we should include residents and nursing students as tradespeople. And so in Boston, they finally make good in the end, I think, of Franklin's vision. And they start giving a lot of the money to medical students at Boston University, Boston College, Harvard, Tufts, and so forth. In Philadelphia, they expand the notion of what the American dream should be. It's no longer opening your own business, it's owning a home. And so in Philadelphia, there's a big movement to unlock Franklin's money to fund home mortgages. And in the book, I find people, police officers, firefighters, turned away by banks in the 70s when mortgage rates were 11 and 12%, get a Franklin loan for their home at less than 5%. Now I mentioned, you know, I, I, I'd love to talk for another hour about this, but I wanna wrap up here. Franklin's money is still circulating today. You can still walk into the Franklin Institute here and see his statue. Just as you know, you can walk into the Franklin Institute of Technology and see people, you know, as the then president said to me, we're creating the middle class, which is a revolutionary act in today's America. And I said, aren't you worried about the fourth industrial revolution and the rise of robotics? And he said, no, we're the people, tra we're training people. We're the ones that are fixing the robots. We're going to be okay. And so, you know, you can still go to the Philadelphia Foundation website and find the Ben Franklin Fund on the drop-down menu and kick in $5, $10. Franklin's money is still funding kids who don't want a four-year college degree, but instead want to learn a trade or a craft, just as you can donate to the Franklin Institute of Technology here. Uh, the money is still ongoing today. All right, I'd like to stop there. Um, I hope you look at the book, you know, either at the library or your local bookstore or uh, an online merchant of your choice. But I'm wondering, Gavin, do we have any questions from the viewers? We do. Uh, and just uh, to your, your last point there, um, Margaret wrote in and said that her father uh, was born and raised in Lynn, Massachusetts and received money from the Franklin Fund. Uh, his parents never owned property or a car. Uh, his father managed an AMP and his mother worked in a shoe factory. Uh, and, his, and her father went to college and medical school on scholarships and received money from the Franklin Fund to pay for his residency at the Children's Hospital. So, and he paid it all back. <laughs> so that's not a, not a question, but a, a good point to, to start. Oh, on. Margaret, that's wonderful. Thanks for writing that in. That, that's great. You made my day. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin would be so happy. Um, so there was an anonymous uh, attendee who said, uh, while doing research for this book, did you get the sense that Franklin had some regret that he didn't spend more time in the U.S. in the final years of his life because he might have influenced the direction the country took regarding slavery? That is such an excellent question. I really did get that sense. And I have to say quickly here, I can show some pictures as I'm, as I'm doing this. You know, if you go back to Philadelphia today, at the end of the book, I imagine like, what would Franklin make of things? You know, he'd probably be surprised to see his face on the bus. He'd probably be surprised to see his name on everything. Um, he'd be surprised to see the entrance to his house is still there. But I see things now, you know, when you look at, this is a t-shirt on sale near Franklin's grave where thoughts and prayers are canceled out and policy and change is written here instead. I think instead, you know, I, I think you're spot on about this. I think had Franklin spent more time in the States, he would have worked harder because, you know, the Pennsylvania hospital is still there. The Pennsylvania Academy, today's pen is still there. A lot of the things that he invented are still used today. The lightning rod is still in the Maryland State House and so forth. I think he would have spent much more time, especially after the bruising Constitu constitutional convention, lobbying and advocating for laws and policies that would be on the books that could be changed over time. Or which, you know, I think he'd see that the way forward in the states wasn't building things, physical things but enacting policy that would be longer lasting and influence further generations. I think that's a really great point. Because when he came home in 1785, he was quite lonely. You know, a lot of his fr older friends obviously had died. Deborah had, had passed away. Um, and he didn't have a lot of associations with his fellow founders. He, they, they saw him as a bit out of touch. And they, they discredited his allegiance to France. You know, because that, look at that revolution that's going on. That's what you get with a direct democracy. Franklin wanted a unicameral legislature. He felt that that was the, the best form of government. And he was really upset when he came back that the Pennsylvania legislature was changing the constitution to have what he said, derided as a upper house and a lower house. He said, you're creating class divisions already. Um, where France, of course, said, oh, we should have a unicameral, didn't work out for them, but they tried it. 
you know, frankly, I'd be really shocked, I think, today that over half of Americans identify as working class, but less than 2% of Congress people have ever held a working class job. He'd see that disconnect and be shocked by it. And I think you're right. He would have endeavored to try to make changes or policies in place that would alleviate that. Well, Peter wrote, um, why do you think that Franklin uh, retained his affection for Boston, a place that he fled as a teenager? He loved Boston to the end. And I think one of the reasons for that is Jane lived there, you know, his, his much adored youngest sister. There was two of 17 children. Um, and she lived, uh, you know, where Franklin, the North, Paul Revere, the North Church is now. You could walk, you could kind of step through what her front door was there. Jill Lepore's book, uh, Book of Ages about Jane is wonderful to read. Um, he, you know, he felt a lot of affection for Boston and he, he visited it as, as, as deputy postmaster. Um, but even toward the end of his life, you know, one of his last requests was writing Jane in Boston saying, could you send me barrels of pickled cod sound to blad air bladders? He loved the delicacies and the food of Boston as well. But you're right, like, you know, he wrote Cotton Mather's son too at the end of his age. And he said, I have to admit, you know, I gave your father a hard time. And I derided, I was Puritan and conservative. But everything I learned about being a philanthropist, being charitable, really did come from your father's works. And my first pen name came from your father. You know, he, Cotton Mather had written a book called Silentarius. Um, and he also wrote a book called Essays to Do Good. And from that, Franklin came up with Silence, Do Good. Um, and so you're right. I think in the end, he thought back on Boston quite affectionately. He never lost that affection for it. Well, thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, and thank you for joining us from the other side of the world. Um, <laughs> waking up very early. <laughs> I hope tomorrow is a good day. <laughs> I can assure all of you that Wednesday is going to be wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, Thanks have a, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.